Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Physics and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible by Pfizer Incorporated. Everybody's probably heard about the tobacco money settlement that went to the Life Science Initiative to develop a life science of corridor in Michigan. Our lab has benefited from that. It pays a portion of my salary so that I have time to collaborate with a lot of people and to, to teach a lot of the students how to do x-ray crystallography. We are a full crystallography, full service crystallography facility here at the university. These are a variety of things we do. We can help uh, researchers get clones of their genes. In fact, we have a big grant in to do a big cloning project with the entire state of Michigan, if our funding comes through. We help you purify your proteins. We help you crystallize them, determine the structures. If you don't have proteins or, and you have a, a protein sequence, we can help you model and get some structural information out of that. So the goal of our laboratory is to help a researcher who doesn't have the techniques or the knowledge within their lab to develop structural biology for their programs. So we write a lot of collaborative grants with people at the, at the university. So we're located in the Life Sciences Institute. And actually, it's a short walk from here. We have a very large, uh, very large wet lab that we share with another faculty member. We have two rooms, environmental rooms, that we grow our crystals in. And we have a large graphics area so people can set and fit their structures. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a little bit. We have two x-ray rooms. Right now, we only have one x-ray unit in there with two detectors, and I'll show you that. Um, we will be getting another one. There are now eight crystallographers on campus. So we have a lot of people using the machine at the Life Sciences Institute and the one other machine that's on campus in the Biophysics Research Institute. So we will have to buy a new system in the near future. Just to give you a, an idea of how many collaborations that the center has, has started since we've been in the Life Sciences Institute, we've worked with people in biophysics, chemistry, heme oncology at the hospital, medicinal chemistry, physiology, <coughs> excuse me, internal medicine, the comprehensive cancer uh, center, biological chemistry, and even people from toxicology. So there was a lot of people out there that want to know the structures of their, bio, uh, their biomolecules that they're working on in their lab, but haven't had the ability to work with a crystallographer, nor the funds actually to bring, or the uh, knowledge to train a postdoc or a graduate student in that, uh, in that curriculum in their own lab, so that we, it makes it easy for them to come to the facility and get some structural data. We work on a variety of diseases. I'm just mentioning in a, f a few that our projects uh, encompass. We have our muscular dystrophy. Cancer is our big, big one that we're working on right now. We've got some projects that deal with uh, trying to develop cures for arthritis, diabetes, and even some bioterrorism defense projects that we're working on. The one thing that these all have in common is that they all have proteins that have malfunctioned. These are proteins regulate your cell, and somewhere along the line, they've, they've become malfunctioning. That either happened at the DNA level, when they got the template that, uh, that says, encodes the protein, the gene. Either it was damaged through hereditary um, propagation, you got it from your mom or dad, or both, or environmental sources, like smoking, um, being out in the sun causes uh, skin cancer. Also, proteins can be targeted themselves, and these are toxins and some of the bioterrorism agents, such as sarin gas, targets uh, acetylcholine esterase and knocks it out and targets your nerve cells. So a lot of the agents that you've heard about prior to um, this last invasion of Iraq, the ones they used, uh, the Saddam used on our soldiers on the first time around, 
those were finding out what proteins are being targeted by those bioterrorism um, agents that he used. Now, why do you care about proteins? Besides that, I told you they regulate, they regulate uh, your cells. They do a whole host of things in your body. So they are enzymes. They are how you digest your food. How do you eat your sugar, your fats, and your proteins? How those are broken down and oxidized into energy to make your muscles move. They are hormones. Um, these are messengers that are, are, uh, res regulate bodily functions, like gastrin, histamine, regulate the acid content in your stomach. Insulin's a big one, the uptake of sugar, or uptake of glucose after you've eaten <coughs> and get it out of your bloodstream. They have storage proteins. And these make, uh, make substances readily available, like myoglobin. Myoglobin is a protein that's in every muscle cell, and it holds oxygen. Hemoglobin carries the oxygen in the blood, transfers it off to myoglobin at the cell and in the muscle cells, and myoglobin holds onto that oxygen until your muscles need it. Transport proteins, serum albumin is a big one that transports fatty acids through your blood. And then structural proteins. I know a lot of plastic surgeons like collagen because they inject a lot of collagen into their patients. And collagen is a very fibrous protein. It makes up all your tendons, uh, your teeth, your bones are all made of collagen. And that's where the calcium deposits in the collagen to make your bones nice and strong. Then there are protective proteins, all your antibodies, your defense against any, any biological agent that comes in your body or any foreign agent that comes into your body, um, cause your antibodies to be kicked into gear in the bloodstream and take them out. And we also contract out proteins. Now those are your actin and myosin. They're the ones that are make up your muscles and allow them to move back and forth. So proteins do a lot of really cool things in the body. So why do we need to study their structures? Well, we need to know where that malfunction is in, in, on the protein. So we can develop drugs to target that specific protein. So in the 1950s, the drug companies came out with a great drug that helped uh, pregnant women with their nausea problem. It cured the nausea. It was great. But when the child was born, the child was born without arms. So it also targeted a fetal protein that was important for development. So we need to, we need to develop drugs for one protein to go into the lighted door so that we can cure a lot of people versus getting a drug that has multiple targets in the body and can cause a lot of deaths. You can think of the protein as being the lock on these doors. We need to know which, um, which key will fit which lock. The protein, we need to know exactly what it looks like and where the malfunctioning point is so we can target drugs to that point. And the drug is the key. We want to make the key very, very specific to our proteins. And this is going to be very, uh, very possible in the not so distant future. With the genome uh, initiative going on and having cloned, I looked at, on a website and had all the lists of all the different organisms that have been cloned now whose genomes are known. It was, it was absolutely amazing. Now that we have that out of the way and we have all the genes located, now NIH is going after all the protein structures, all the things that are unique, all the unique protein structures in the body. So there's been very big pushes and we have huge ge structural genomic centers that are cherry picking. They're taking all the easy ones off the, off the tree. So the researchers here, we get some of the more harder ones to, uh, to uh, solve their structures up. But within your children's lifetime, at least, they'll see probably the majority of the proteins solved. So to speak, when we talk about proteins, we need to get on the level of proteins. So I've shown here a pen. And this is just a, a straight pen. Anybody ever get a, a, a sliver and get their pen out and they flame it first, sterilize it before they put it on their finger and dig it out? That's because if you blow it up, so this is blown up, a regular straight pin blown up 100 times. You blow it up 10,000 times, you start seeing these little orange globbies on there. And those are bacteria, all the bacteria that's set on the pen. And then you blow it up 
a million times, and then you can start seeing the actual outline of the bacteria. Now if you go 10 to the 10th to get into the angstrom level, now you're on the, the, the uh, size of looking at the individual atoms. Proteins are one of the four uh, biomolecules in your cells. We have the proteins, a representative protein is on top. Each one of these circles, the, uh, the white circles are carbons, the blue are nitrogen, the red are oxygen in all of these pictures. So a protein, this is a, a small protein, is compared to another biomolecule that's important. This is the bilipid membrane. So we have these look like, you can envision them as hairpins that come together. The, the, the uh, legs are very hydrophobic. They hate being next to water. So they combine together and form this large hydrophobic interface. This is a representative of a DNA, DNA molecule, your nucleic acids. And then we have the sweet old sugar molecule down there that most everybody likes. So what really are proteins? Proteins are simply biopolymers of amino acids. There are 20 amino acids that encode for proteins. So just like our alphabet encodes for our words, our amino acids encoding for proteins, we can make many thousands of different kinds of proteins by combining in different ways the amino acids and how they come together. They are organic molecules, they are carbon-based, and they have um, four basic properties. They either like water, they're hydrophilic, that's water-loving, they hate water, they're hydrophobic, they have a positive charge on them, on the side chains, and they have, or they have a negative charge. And those, you can, you can imagine, would form ionic bonds to help hold protein structures together. They all have a common structure, and I've listed that below. They all have the amino group on this side. That's an N with three nitrogens. And then they have a carbon with two, um, bonded to two oxygens, and that's the carboxylic acid group. They have a central carbon atom called a C-alpha and I'll probably slip and say C-alpha periodically, and a side chain. And this side chain is also an organic molecule that sticks on, and that's where all the properties of the residues of the amino acids is held. Now, some people think of this, <coughs> think of a protein as a charm bracelet, and the amino acids as the uh, charms that you stick on the bracelet. It is a polymer, so those amino acids combine, and I've shown you a polymer up here. These are, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight amino acids in this protein. And they're all hooked together, and this, this portion of the, of the protein is called the backbone. And you can think of it as, as looking similar to this if you don't want to look at the bonding pattern. So my backbone and my protein is everything that's in common with all of the amino acids. And then their side chains all differ as they come off of the backbone. This is called the primary structure of a protein. Now when it starts, when it starts being translated in the cell, so it's being made, it starts folding. Now the actual process of folding is not known yet. A lot of people have a lot of theories. They've done, well, done good jobs. I don't know if you've ever participated maybe in the SETI at home program and had SETI searching on your computer um, for your screensaver. They also have, you can have proteins folding as screensavers now as well. <laughs> and then they get sent back. So they've been able to fold a few protein structures, but they took a very small one, and it took about 300 CPU hours uh, in this day and age to do it. So it's not a simple task, and you have to turn around and solve the structure by either crystallography or NMR to prove that it's in the right conformation. But when they start to fold, they form specific secondary structure inside them. So we started off with a primary structure, all linear, and now I folded it and made a kink into it. And I have a line here and a line here. Assume this is a really long protein. So these are called secondary structures that happen. We have beta sheets, and then we have curlicues called alpha helices that happen. 
and I sat home and made this one for you guys. <laughs> so the beta sheets are in the center, and the curly cues are the alpha helis. These are the secondary structures. When the protein folds, they have a lot of residues, a lot of amino acid side chains that hate water, so they exclude the energy that drives this thing to, these things to fold together is driven from excluding water. It's called the hydrophobic effect. And then they pack together, and then this is the tertiary structure of a protein. A lot of proteins, this is where they end. This is how big they get. Um, they can vary in size from, we work on proteins that are only 25 amino acids long, all the way up to over 1,000 amino acids that we're trying to solve structures for them. They're soluble proteins and they're membrane proteins. But if we need more than one subunit, so we have one, more than one tertiary structure, if we had two of these coming together and bonding together, that would be called a quaternary, or quaternary structure. So your myoglobin in your cells uses the same function and same sort of scaffold protein. It looks just like hemoglobin, but it's only one subunit in your muscle cells. Hemoglobin, which was in your blood cells that carry uh, the predominant amount of oxygen, actually have four subunits, identical subunits that come together, or identical in three-dimensional structure. So here's an example of one that we solved in the lab. This was one of the largest proteins solved here at the, at the university. The, um, it is involved in Charcot-Marie II syndrome. So what happens is a hereditary disease that when you get it, you get clawed feet and your arms start curling and you become paraplegic or quadriplegic from it. What happens is just like the uh, cords down here are all insulated, your nerve cells, are, your nerves are all insulated as well with myelin sheath. And what happens in Charcot-Marie II syndrome in the extremities, that myelin sheath starts unraveling and it gets breaks. You know, when your cords get breaks in it, I don't know if you've ever run over your sweeper cord and put a nice gash in it, they don't work very well anymore. They start short-circuiting. Same thing happens with your nerve cells. It's a defect in this protein that helps, or that propagates that disorder in uh, these patients. This protein, um, you can see up at the top, there is, these are the beta strands, and down here are a bunch of curlicues, those are the, the alpha helices. There are regions on these, this is a, a one domain that can pack, or one region of the protein that can fold independently of the rest of the molecule. And then this, pro, this part of the protein actually has all of its function. This up here is to bind to things, and this actually chews up things, chews up uh, phosphate groups off of uh, inositols. And the entire protein, out of the entire protein, it is the yellow portion right there that holds all the function of the protein. It's just that little piece, the rest of it's scaffolding, holding it in place. So let's start at the beginning. How do we go about isolating a protein? So one of the first things we do, um, we can clone by phone, since the genome's done. There's a lot of genes already out there, and we can get them. Or we can take a cell line and do PCR out of the cell line, and we get a piece of DNA. And our piece of DNA that we want is here. Then we can get a vector. You can either make these in your laboratory, and they are all DNA as well, or most of the com there's a lot of different vectors out there, uh, so we just purchase them. And then we can insert insert this DNA into the vector, and it becomes circular. And this is called recombinant DNA. And then we put it in E. coli. Most of our expression is done in E. coli. And I'm sorry, I forgot to bring a flask. Um, when you're growing E. coli, it looks like you're brewing beer, and it stinks. <laughs> but it's, it's, it looks like beer that needs to be desperately filtered before you drink it. So the way we get it into the cells, the E. coli cells, is that we, we incubate it with the E. coli. We put the DNA and E. coli in a test tube together and incubate it. Then we, we have it on ice so it gets cold. And it's almost like the E. coli grow goosebumps. And the DNA sets down on top of the E. coli. Then we stick it in a, a water bath and heat it up and make it sweat. And the DNA drops right in. And E. coli will sit there and propagate this DNA for you 
and it won't hurt. It, uh, we're only using a, a gene. So I work with Yersinia pestis, and that is the organism that uh, causes bubonic plague. So it wiped out Europe, half of Europe, twice in, in the, the last two centuries. The, but I work with just one gene of that protein, so I don't have to worry about getting it myself because I took the gene out. It needs the entire organism to get in my body and hurt me. So I can put it in E. coli and I'm perfectly safe. Although the government wasn't so sure, so the, I got caught in the Patriot Act for a year and it was taken away. <laughs> I have it back. <laughs> and we're working on it again. <laughs> so I love that Patriot Act. <clears throat> So we grow, we grow, um, we have big shakers, and these flasks are about this high and about this big around that we grow our E. coli in. We grow a liter of it in one flask, and we stick it, and it shakes overnight, or for at least a few hours. Some grow better than other uh, cell lines, and um, we grow it at our body temperatures because that's where E. coli loves it the best. 37 degrees Celsius is where they love to grow. You get it too, too hot, you'll kill your cultures. If you get it too low, you won't be able to grow your cultures too well. So we grow that up, and then we take and we centrifuge down the cells. The cells are heavy, so we put them in the centrifuge, and they're at the bottom. We can pour out all the beer-looking solution. Then we take those cells, and we do one of two things to it. We disrupt the cell lining by, we can do it well, three ways. Chemically, putting lysozyme in to chew up the cell wall of the E. coli which then we contaminate our, protein, our proteins with lysozyme. And a crystallographer hates, to, hates that because lysozyme crystallizes. And if you, never, if you don't get it purified away, you're going to go through all the experiments I'm going to show you and end up crystallizing lysozyme, which I don't know, there's probably 200 structures of lysozyme solved. So we don't really need to be, we don't want to solve another one unless we're looking at folding patterns of lysozyme. Uh, so the other two methods we use, we either sonicate it put it in a ultrasonicating bath, or we crush it. We have a French press that we have. It's a, it's a piston that goes inside of it, and it pressurizes that cell to 20,000 uh, PSI. And it squirts out the, the cells out this little pinhole that's very tiny, and it disrupts the cells. And actually, that's one of the best ways to do it, and get your protein. Then Based on uh, the amino acid side chains, those R groups, these groups that hang off the side, they all have different properties. Each protein has its own defined properties, and we can isolate one protein from another based on the properties of their amino acids. So we do this by putting them through columns that are filled with different types of gels. And they bind, based on their properties, they bind to these gels at different rates and then we can, we can elute them off. They're just really long tubes with a gel matrix, sort of like making jello on the inside. Their little pores are different. They're little tiny beads, not one solid gel that's in there. And their pore sizes are different, so we can do it based on size. And we can also do it based on charge. Some of the amino acids have negative charges. Some of them have positive. So the whole protein is charged differently from another whole protein. So once we get those isolated off of a column, then we can centrifuge it and concentrate it. And we concentrate our proteins to about 10 mg per milligram to do our crystallization studies. And this is a little clip, let me know if you can hear this, on how we do crystallization. Many techniques have been devised to grow crystals, but all are variations on the same general principle to bring a solution of protein to the point of supersaturation in the hope that crystals will form. The method we will use depends on simple evaporation. A solution of buffer and a precipitating agent are introduced into the bottom of a small container or well. A drop of protein solution mixed with some buffer and precipitant is placed on a glass cover slip. This solution is called the mother liquor. The slip is then inverted and sealed to the top of the well. This forms the hanging drop for which the method is named. Over time, days, weeks, or even months, water from the mother liquor is lost to the chamber through vapor diffusion, 
and its protein content becomes more and more concentrated. If the crystallographer is very lucky, sometimes protein crystals will begin to form in the drop. crystal looked awfully big, but it probably um, was less than a half a millimeter in total length because it was a rather large crystal. The crystal sizes that we're typically using um, are about 20 microns in <coughs> length. That's as small as we can go because we need to be able to manipulate it and see it. And right now our beam source that I'm going to talk about isn't small enough that we can see anything smaller than that at our home source. So that way we go to the synchrotron and we can get that. We crystallize proteins just like they do. We use several plates, and I brought some up here if people want to look at them afterwards. We can have the hanging drop, which they showed in the picture, and we seal that with EM oil as a way we seal our, uh, our uh, cover slips on the top. We have sitting drop, which works by the same principle, and we put a little drop of protein in the post inside the well, and around the well, we fill it with different precipitants, different buffer pHs, different organic solvents, different salts. And then we put an equal volume of that well solution on top of our protein solution. And we cover it with plastic tape. The little duck, everybody likes the little clear, the one that says duck has a little duck on it, the clear mailing tape. And that's what we use to seal that. And it seals it uh, well for about a month. We also, the whole world is going to high throughput, high throughput everything. We are doing some drug work um, with the Cancer Institute or Cancer Center here at the University of Michigan. Uh, Xiaomeng Wang and I collaborate together. He has a whole host of organic chemists that are making hundreds of compounds to several uh, targets in, for cancer. And what we're trying to do is help them develop new drugs with that and show them where their current drugs bind. So we use smaller plates. We can do um, three times 96 on this well, on this plate. We have three sample sitting drop sample places and a big, large uh, precipitant uh, chamber for each one. We fill these up, and then we can seal them with uh, plastic tape as well. With Janet Smith coming up, um, she got, as part of her startup package, money to buy a crystallization robot, which we are really excited about. So it can set up one of these plates in about two to three minutes versus us, <laughs> where we use multi-well, you can use multi-well uh, pipe headers, multi-channel pipe headers, but it still takes about an hour to do one of these plates for my students. So that'll be a real boon for us to have something um, that can do more high throughput with all these drug studies. This is what um, one of the rooms looks like. Actually, we've <clears throat> just had it redone, and now we're each person's going to have their in own individual little cabinet that with a door on it and everything to shut it up so we can keep everybody's stuff separate. But this is the way we used to do it, and everybody's trays would be sitting there. Now we hope to have um, abundance, more, a uh, lot more room with uh, going to these smaller trays. Now we'll let these trays sit there. Some of them have sat there for a year, and actually. I got, in graduate school, I got one of my best crystals after a year of setting there because evidently there was some cleavage project um, that occurred. And it diffracted to 1.3 angstroms. That means I could see um, atoms that were within 1.3 angstroms away from each other with real good competency. So I was almost to atomic resolution with that, but it took a year to grow. When we do our crystal screens, <coughs> there are a lot of commercial screens out there based on um, Janaric and Kim's first work on looking at infinite factorial screens and sampling different organic solvents, different pHs in a variety of different um, crystalline spaces. So we, uh, very far apart. And they developed a, a 50 solution uh, matrix. And now we use, there's probably, I don't know, 20 different commercial screens that you can get based on that property. <clears throat> the structural genomics groups have shown that you really don't need to screen a lot of these because there's a lot of overlap 
pick four distinctly different ones, and chances are those will work well for you in the lab. So we have, um, we run actually 300. Every protein that comes into our lab goes through 300 different solutions to test to set it up to see if we can get crystals out of them. And these are some of the things, I, bought, I got this out of one of the crystallization books. The, um, this is how they look underneath the microscope. We get a variety of different things. They range from being clear to, I don't know how many people come to me and say, I got a crystal. And actually, that's a piece of uh, the plastic from the pipette they use to set it up. <laughs> They'll also come and they have colored strands in there. And I said, you wore a green sweater that day, didn't you? <laughs> you know, so I try to teach people to come in their t-shirts and set up. Don't play with their hair. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you got a beard, don't sit there over top of it. Otherwise, you could spoil your crystallization um, mix. Actually, there is one lab whose professor, they was, used to beg him to come and set and go over their beard when they couldn't get any crystals because his beard always had a few crumbs in it. And they would have nucleation sites and start crystal growth sites. <laughs> So none of these are very good, but they give you an indication. None of these have grown crystals that are up here that I'm showing you, but they give you an indication of what next to do when you don't get crystals right from the start. You, you work with what you have. This isn't bad, working with the gelatinous. Spherulites, hey, maybe it happened, maybe they formed this type of aggregate because you forgot a reducing agent. Maybe there's some cysteines on the surface of this that actually oxidize and form disulfide bonds, like your hair. Your hair is filled with disulfide bonds. That's how you perm your hair and make it curly, because you change the di disulfide bonding patterns of the protein in your hair. So if you don't pay attention to those, when you set those up, you can get these weird glass-like globs from your uh, crystals or your protein. Now, these are a little bit better. These show. You can see you're starting to get some, crystal, uh, some crystals forming. Here's some single crystals. What you want is right here. You want to form, you want to get that precipitant um, right, the organic solvent, the salt concentration, the pH just so, so that you can grow nice, well-formed crystals that look much like your diamonds, ladies. They're nice, smooth surfaces, real sharp edges, and you know how your diamonds especially those colorless ones, when you first get them and the light shines, sunlight shines on them, and they just beam, they reflect the light all over the place. And you see nice, discreet little spots all over. Protein crystals do the exact same thing, but only under x-ray light, not under sunlight. So we want them to look just like well-cut gems, only they're microscopic. These are some of the crystals that um, we grew for that structure the Charcot-Marie Tooth Syndrome structure, the MTMR2 that I showed you. We started off in a screen of <coughs> uh, about 200 solutions for this project, and we got these little tiny, tiny needles. This is on 75x power on the microscope to try to even see these. These are about uh, less than a tenth of a millimeter in, uh, or micron. There are 10 microns in size. Then we grew this in a polyethylene glycol um, with a molecular weight average of 8,000. We then took and tried a variety of different polyethylene glycols. They range from 200 all the way up to 40,000. And so we went through and we tried that. We tried changing the pH, adding different buffers in with it and different reducing agents. And finally, we got these beautiful crystals with an unusual one. We couldn't find any other crystal that ever had been crystallized with the PEG 35,000. This is more in the industrial strength PEG that's out there. Uh, but these crystals were great. They diffracted to almost two angstroms at the synchrotron. These are uh, one of the cancer targets that we're working on in, the, in collaboration with Xiaomeng Wang's lab. And they have five different compounds, and I've labeled them to C1 through C106 on the slide, or C136. The protein grew very nicely, and you can see the, the crystals range in different color. It's the same protein in every one, but the crystals change color based on the drugs that are complexed with them. So these drugs have different chromatophores that um, cause, 
cause the light to, to uh, change. The cool thing about this is that we thought we had the drugs in there. Great. I set them up before Christmas. I came back after Christmas. We got color. We got drugs. Went to the synchrotron, took all the data, came home, stayed up all weekend solving the structures, and found that, yes, the drug's there, but we can't see it all the time because a piece of a protein, an extra piece that was on this protein, actually bound where the drug wants to bind. And the drug had to compete with it, and it causes it to crystallize. It forms these beautiful crystals because of this extra piece that was on the protein. It didn't have really anything to do with the biological protein at all. It was just an artifact of the cloning method that we used. And it stuck in there. And the drug could only compete part of it away. So we were really upset <laughs> when we finally solved the structure. So we had to go back to the drawing board and uh, re-engineer re the protein and grow new, and grow new protein crystals um, complexed with their drugs. These, we actually incubate the drug and the protein together on the bench um, one to two days even before we actually set up the crystallization experiments. So we want to make sure the drug is very well bound to the protein before we begin our experiments. So once we get a good crystal, then what we do is we, we have to um, shoot it with an x-ray beam. So when we do that, it's radiation, Radi radiation, sun radiation deteriorates your skin cells. So x-ray beam radiation deteriorates the uh, proteins as well. So they tend to uh, decay over time period in the beam. So we freeze them. And the way we do that, we have the loop that we pick them up in. Have a, this is a microscopic loop. And then the crystal sits in the center. And the crystal's held there by surface tension. So we pick it up out of our drop. And then we put it into a cryoprotectant because we're going to freeze it at liquid nitrogen temperatures at minus 180 degrees Celsius. So we, tr um, we put it in a bunch of different types of sugars. They are good uh, cryoprotectants. These protein crystals are made up of about 50% water. So we need to get rid of some of that water because as soon as it hits that cold temperature, that water structure is going to freeze and it's going to cause the crystals to burst. So we need to protect them and replace some of that. And some of the sugars that we use are glucose and sucrose, which is your table sugar, uh, xylitol, which is in some of your gums that you're chewing, um, ethylene glycol. We found one of the salts is, very, is a very good cryoprotectant, lithium chloride. And these other organics, the small, uh, the small polyethylene glycols are good as well. Once we pick that up on a loop, so I have these down here if anybody wants to look at it. We have a cryovial and we have this fancy little wand that ejects it off for us when we're in the liquid nitrogen. We pick it up and we immediately dunk it into a liquid nitrogen bath. And I, actually it would be an ice bucket very similar to this. We would just dump our, dunk our crystal in there. This would be on a set of cryostats that's already in there and then we have to fit them together under the liquid nitrogen. Once they're fit, oops. <laughs> It doesn't have a crystal in it, luckily. Um, once they're actually fit together, you can take them out and put them on a cane. You have about 20 seconds of handling time with these before um, the liquid nitrogen boils off and you've ruined your crystal. And it caught, you ruin it and it ices. You get big, beautiful ice rings um, when you go to look at it under x-rays. So this is our x-ray unit that we have in-house. This is over in the Life Sciences Institute. We've got the x-ray generator here. There's a transformer under here. This, uh, this housing holds a wheel that looks just like a cheese wheel uh, that you would buy in this store, and it's made of copper. So we use copper wavelength radiation to hit our crystals. The, crystal, the radiation is generated here, and it comes out at a takeoff angles of six degrees. On either side, we have two ports. And then this is the mirror assembly that we focus it at on this side, the other mirror assembly is here. It comes down the collimator, and the crystal is mounted here in this area. On this side, we collect the data with an imaged plate. It's, uh, it's <coughs> we can shoot and, and collect the data. It's turned around, and then a laser reads the data off. And then it, goes, it rotates another uh, quarter degree on the back. And there are um, really strong fluorescent lights that erase the film. And then you can start a new, 
a new data collection uh, frame. On the other side is a charge couple device. It's a smart, Brooker Smart set, uh, 2000 CCD. And this one, the d you have to, um, each image takes about three minutes at the minimum. And we're usually taking pictures at about a half hour time period on this machine. This one will take it, uh, an image, in about a minute. But it's only, it's a very small face. You have a little face here where on this side, if you looked at the front of it, it would be almost the entire um, length from here to the bottom to the, to the blue line. So that face is huge. So we can collect a lot of data in one fell swoop on the other one. We also cool our crystals to liquid nitrogen temperatures here um, <coughs> with our system. We don't, you don't see any big tanks in there, though, of liquid nitrogen. That's because we make the liquid nitrogen right out of the air. So what's out of frame in the picture in the corner, we have an air compressor and then a dryer. So we take all the water out of it. And then it goes into the back on the wall is a filter bank that we filter out everything but nitrogen. And actually, the company developed this. I didn't do this. The, um, then it comes down here to this compressor. And this is a helium compressor, cools it to liquid helium temperatures. And then it comes out this nozzle. And this nozzle actually is not faced. It's a room temperature set up for the day the picture was taken. But there's a nozzle here that will actually spew liquid nitrogen out. So you have to adjust the rate so you're just getting the boil off coming out at your crystal. Now, when I take those drugs, the pictures of the crystals that I showed you that had the drugs in them, when I took a picture here, after an hour of taking it in-house, I could see spots to six angstroms. That means I can see um, in the structure, I can confidently pick two two atoms out at six angstroms. In other words, I can't solve the structure. I can't do a thing with that data set. So that was one hour, and I couldn't do a thing with it here. And that's one frame. And these have to be 180 frames is what I need. So you can imagine the timeline it would take me to take, try to take data here. We went to the synchrotron. This is APS, uh, the advanced photon source at Ar Argonne National Labs in Chicago. One second per frame. One second. I am in heaven when I go here. <coughs> we have a, um, we've had access to um, Comcat 32, ID32. It has um, a robotic system on it. That robot holds 20 samples, 20 crystals at a time. We'll automatically put them up for you. And I just sit and I click on the center to tell it to center in the control room. It's wonderful. And so I can screen myself. I can go down. Actually, I took my father. He never made it. He never had a chance to go to college. He went along as my water boy one day to the synchrotron and sat there all night with me collecting data. And he was so thrilled because um, it was so easy to do. I just needed somebody to go literally go get me some water periodically so that I could continue working. This facility runs um, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And before, when we went to some of the smaller beam lines, <coughs> or some of the weaker beam lines, I should say, we would actually get three days of time. And the longest time I've spent up in one, one session is when I was running three separate beam lines. And if you don't know, this thing is huge. It's, it's about three kilometers in, in uh, diameter. There's tricycles, these big tricycles. OSHA won't let you ride a bicycle because you'll fall off. The tricycles that you ride to go around, <laughs> they all have a little flag that dangles in the back. <coughs> I was actually taking data over here. And uh, a group that I had taken, another team I had, was over in this region. So we'd have to ride bikes back and forth or be on the phone constantly. And I was up 72 hours um, straight one day, or one time, collecting data. I got vertigo really bad after that, so I, I vowed never to stay up more than 48 hours. Um, with the invention of the robot, on the, being able to reuse the robot on that line, I can get my data in 24 hours and be home. And we love it. We go the day we're going to collect data and then never go to bed. We never get a hotel room and just come right back home. So don't tell the police. <laughs> uh, this is the, the actual ring. There's a Linux accelerator and then the synchrotron portion is here and the storage ring goes around the entire entire system. These are cars to give you a relative idea of how big the facility is. Um, each one of these little triangles is a lab office module. 
we, I am happy to say, are going to get one of our own here in Michigan. This is absolutely fabulous. This is, um, I, I was very much, obviously, uh, a proponent of the infrastructure grants, five infrastructure grants that the um, MEDC funded with the tobacco money. One was for structural biology. So we got a 900 megahertz NMR, which is cutting edge for the other form of structural biology. The, you can also use NMR to solve uh, structures. And that is being installed at, Wayne, or at uh, Michigan State University. On top of that, besides some of the little monies that went to all the different universities. So if you don't know, there's four, group, four universities in on this. There's us at U of M, Michigan State University, Wayne State University, and the Van Andel Institute in, in uh, Grand Rapids. So all of us have core facilities. There is a transgenic uh, mouse facility here at the U of M and Van Andel. There is uh, structural biology at all of the universities. We have bioinformatics that is available, proteomics, and genomics. So we're here to help not only the researchers within our own university, but we're also there to help start up biotech companies in the, in the vicinity to help them because they don't want, don't want to sit and buy a, put a, a million bucks into an x-ray unit. They want to be able to come over and use ours. They don't have access to a 900 megahertz. The Dow people and the Pfizer people are ecstatic that there's a 900 megahertz going to be sitting uh, up there at MSU to be able to use. One other thing that I'm really excited about is that they gave us money to build a beam line at APS so that we can remain very competitive with the rest of the world. So the researchers at all Michigan universities can use this beam line. We've also partnered with Northwestern uh, University, who already had a pre-existing beam line there and knew how to design. Their, their portion of this was that they were going to design our beam line and help manage it for us. So we're really excited that in another year, we'll have one of those little triangles. This is what the experimental hall looks like. There, our LS cat is, that's what we're called, the life science cat. We are actually on it now. Um, and they're starting to build our hutches and things. <clears throat> so here's the, the entire layout you can see. And you can find this. MSU has it with our name on it. And then APS has another rendition of it there. But there's a storage ring that goes around here. The LINAC is here for the linear accelerator. And then the synchrotron portion is here. So we're going to be down here in sector 21. The stuff that I've been talking about has happened on Comcat 32, which was a pre-existing line, commercial line at APS. This is MCA. So MCA is pretty much next door at 17, sector 17. They are, <coughs> they have really nice pictures on their website, so that's why I grabbed them. <coughs> Eleven pharmaceutical companies went together and built their own beam line, and that is called MCA. And this is their lab that they have. It's very nice. All the lab office modules have labs associated with them. And they look very similar to this. And then there is a place on the experimental hall where you sit and do um, all your data collection. Um, Comcat has an actual control room that you set in. So does BioCars. You can go in, and it's an, like an office setting right on the experimental floor. Um, this is a pretty jazzy place that IMCA's got. This is their optics, just to focus. I showed you on our beam line, or our x-ray unit here, that little tiny silver box was our mirror system to focus uh, our x-rays. Theirs have to be super cooled, so it's a huge box at IMCA, and they have some really nice optics, but that would be for another lecture. The, um, I grabbed this. Uh, <coughs> APS is very similar to this. This is the synchrotron portion at spring 8, which is in Japan. And it has a storage capacity of 8 gigavolts, where APS has a storage capacity of 7 gigavolts. Um, these are the magnets that are in the synchrotron. You have the big blue or the bending magnets. And they keep the uh, electrons circular, in a circular orbit around the ring. The uh, electron beam is stabilized by the sextuple, sextuple magnets, and then focused by the quadrupoles. Now, I was told that these magnets are so strong that they can hold five full-size pickup trucks in, for one magnet. 
So that's pretty impressive. They can really make those electrons scream. For those who um, <coughs> may not be familiar with the uh, uh, X-ray radi radiation, uh, when you're driving in your car and you drive a little too fast around, hot riding around the corner, and your tires squeal, your tires are giving off a form of energy, and it's in the form of sound. When X-rays or when electrons go screaming around the corner, they give off uh, sound, not sound, but energy in the form of x-rays, um, which is light energy that, that we actually uh, benefit from. This is what a diffraction pattern looks like when we put a crystal in the x-ray beam. We get out um, a series of light and dark spots that have specific arrays. Each protein crystal has its own unique array of molecules. So uh, their, their pattern of light to dark uh, are different. This goes out, you can see a spot here at 2.1 angstrom's resolution. That means I could solve the structure, or I did solve the structure of this one. This is actually um, banana lectin. This is a, a, uh, <coughs> a protein that uh, Erwin Goldstein from biochemistry was very interested in having solved, so we solved it for him and complexed it with several of the sugars that he's been studying. And so we've been able to get really nice resolution. What you can tell from this is, so the farther it goes out, the higher the resolution it is. This, the distance between the spots actually define a unit cell or a shoebox, which contains all the symmetry w information within a cell. And that cell is then three-dimensionally translated to make up the crystal. So we're actually looking at just a cell when we're looking at this. And we can divide that cell into an even smaller unit that when we apply all the symmetry operators, uh, two-fold axis rotations, three-fold, four-fold, six-fold axis rotations, or translations, we can solve a very small amount of that crystal structure and be able to propagate it and make the entire uh, lattice, recreate the entire lattice for the crystal. While I was on the website, I saw this thing that was really cool, I thought. This is at APS. So synchrotron radiation isn't only used, uh, obviously, for protein crystallography. <clears throat> There's many, many uses for it. But one that they're touting right now, which I thought was really cool, is they've tethered that fly in an x-ray beam. So <laughs> they have a movie on their website. They have this fly tethered in there. It thinks it's, it's in a chamber that is free flight, so it's just flying along just fine. It's just not going anywhere. <clears throat> and then they're shooting x-rays through it. And you're, they're, the diffraction pattern that you see up there is actually the muscle movement. This is a fiber. Your, your, your proteins, your muscles are actually long fibers, so you're seeing fiber diffraction. And you can watch this change as the wings move because they're isolating. They're trying to figure out how muscles actually work and how the cardiac muscle, how your heart works. So they're studying, studying the uh, wing, wing speed of flies to do this, which is really interesting. <laughs> so I couldn't resist. <clears throat> um, this is back at the life science. We have, uh, uh, this is our graphics room. So we have a beautiful, it's a very beautiful center and they have they complain because we have these beautiful windows with a nice view out them, and we always keep them closed. <laughs> so we can see what's on our computer screens. Now let me show you. <clears throat> Once you get the crystal data, then you can start to solve the structure. The way you do that is, I'm not going to go through all the math to, to handle the production of the electron density. But when you, when you solve the structure, you develop a map of electron density. Can you see that? Oh, those lights are obscuring it. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so this is what we look at without any molecule in it. So we start off with just this grid. And from there, we have to set and try to figure out where are the se secondary structural elements. Where are the helices? Where are the strands in the, in the protein? By just looking at this grid of mesh, or this uh, spaghetti, or maze. Once we pinpoint a region that we can see that this is a continuous region here, that it keeps going. So that I bet that's a protein um, backbone that goes through there 
That would be, if you think of it as a charm bracelet, the part, the part that's the bracelet that's coming down, or the pink pipe cleaner part. And then we can start spil building in a scaffolding. So we build these in, we actually bring in another structure of another protein, and we cut and paste into the density, and we start, we can move each individual atom of the structure around. Once we get the main chain built, then we can go into looking at um, fitting the side chain into the density to try to figure out where the sequence are, where the sequence is. We don't know where it is when we're first starting, so we have to look for these big bulky residues like a tryptophan as markers for our sequence and putting it in. So we sit there and we can fit each individual atom and rotate it around and with all its torsion angles and everything and get it fit into electron density so that we can come up with the full molecule. So when we, for the crystallographers, we don't look at hydrogens because we're typically not down at atomic resolution. Plus if I put the hydrogens on here, it would totally obscure the rest of the protein because there's so many more hydrogens than there are carbons on the structure. You would never be able to tell how the protein actually folds and works. So coming back to the full structure, once we have the full structure, then we can start looking at regions on this structure that are important to its biological function. Now, we had some um, mutational work done at the bench, so we had some idea of what residues were supposed to be important and what were not. And <coughs> we could look and see what this structure has in common with other structures of, of in its family that have been solved. So this is a, a type of pr uh, protein phosphatase, and it has a similar scaffold as another protein phosphatase that I solved when I was in my um, postdoc work. And that, the portion that it has in common is shown in red. So I knew based on the sequence of that, that this area was going to be the most important piece of this protein. And then we could set and look at, we could scan in at the, um, at the active site, it's called the active site because that's where the function is, and look at all the residues and all the atoms that were important in holding the substrate or the portion that comes in. So I said this, this likes phosphate. So a phosphate sits there, and I've shown that here. There's a phosphate in this region that's in green electron density in here, and the phosphate is stabilized by these ring, this ring structure, and these are the backbones that actually, backbone amides that come into play and actually stabilize the position of that phosphate. And then the, the cysteine that's underneath that sulfur atom will attack the phosphorus of the phosphate in the reaction. Now this isn't the entire substrate, this is just the phosphate portion. <coughs> we crystallized it with the entire substrate and we couldn't see the whole thing. It was a type of sugar that has three phosphate groups on it. What we could do is we could see where these phosphates were in density, so that was clearly noted. And based on their position, then we knew how the ring should set into, into the pocket, so we could model that in. And then we could look at the important residues around it to find out which ones interact with it. And to prove that our model was correct, we took the ones that I just went through and highlighted and we mutated them and we, we watched its activity of the, the function of the protein change. And then we could map it back to the structure and figure out which residues are absolutely vital for this protein's function. And that's what we do with <coughs> when we're looking at drug targets. So I told you we're working on a cancer project, um, developing drugs to cancer uh, targets, we're working on uh, anti-apoptotic proteins. These are proteins that are in your cell, and your cell has a normal life cycle. It divides, it mature, or it, it differentiates, it matures, and then it dies. So it's a natural life cycle for many cells. The proteins that we're trying to look at prevent that cell from dying and make them immortal. So a lot of the chemotherapy drugs, the cancer, they work against, <coughs> they initially work against the cancer tumor or the cancer cells and kill them. But then five years later you get a reoccurrence. That's because not all the cells were dead. 
some of these cells were very slow growing because most of our cancer drugs target fast growing cells. These were the slower growing cells that have overexpressed, have too much of these proteins in them and prevent those cells from dying. So what we're trying to do is figure out drugs that will actually go into the cell, bind specifically to these proteins, and then allow, the, allow chemotherapy to do its work and allow radiation therapy to do its work. So it will be used as, uh, in, con, uh, in uh, addition to some of the other therapies that are out there, but it will kill some of these long-term types of cells. And that's what we're working on. So we're actually, we solved the structure of these proteins, and then we had to determine where is the site of its function. And now we're concentrating in that site of its function and we're determining what residues are the most important for its function and how those work so we can make a drug that looks just like its substrate that it wants to bind, the, other, the native molecule that it wants to bind in the cell to prevent the cell, pre prevent the cell from dying. Because once we close that, once we close that gap up with a drug, then this protein sits and it's happy and it sits over here and it's out of the way and the machinery that normally uh, function to kill the cell can happily go along their way and the cell can die. <coughs> I talked at the first of the hour, or at the beginning of the hour, about solving unique structures. So the MTMR2 structure was a unique structure. It had a whole family of proteins, and I'm only showing one here that we published in the paper. But it has about 10 to 12 other members, family members. We don't have to solve all of those structures now to understand those functions, because we know they all have the same residues in common. They all have very key residues that are conserved, and these are highly conserved. The, the residues, the amino acids that are the same between the two are, are highly conserved. And actually, MTM1 causes a type of cancer to happen. So we know what its function is based on this structure. So we can, it's good to find unique structures and then be able to do the bioinformatics work, align the amino acid sequences, and pick out regions that are the most important in all those structures. So you don't have to go and solve them all. <coughs> so this is a, a truly accurate, uh, exact, but it's, uh, it's approximately right. <laughs> um, you start off, when you, when you try to get a drug from the bench into the patient or to the patient, you start off with hundreds of compounds per target. The people that were working with the cancer uh, center, they wanted to look at seven different targets. So you can imagine how many compounds we are going, they have to synthesize, and then we are screening through crystallization to help them out and try to figure out where these things bind. Less than 10 of them actually enter clinical trials, and typically it's about five or six that go through the clinical trials. And they start with animal models, and or start with the cells. Can they get them into cells? Then they go to animal models. Then they go to healthy people. They, Pfizer, I have a person come every year to my uh, biochemistry class and talk about uh, well-person clinical trials where they try the drugs out on people that are fine to see how, what their dosage level, they can a well-person can tolerate so that they can give it to, uh, know what dosage they can give to the sick person. And then finally, they do trials with the sick people, uh, the people that actually have the disease. Hopefully, one candidate will make it. That's what they all hope for. Many times, they fail. <coughs> they literally then have to file, file um, tr semi-truckloads of paper to the FDA to get drug approval. It's amazing. I mean, about three semi-truckloads of paper go to the FDA for one drug. I don't know who reads all that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then it can, after they, uh, they get seek FDA approval, then it can be distributed to, to uh, the patients. It takes about $500,000 per drug to do this. So it costs a lot, and not every drug makes it. A lot of them fail throughout this. So it, it really does cost a lot to make 
the drugs that are out there, and we're only beginning to see the cost with some of the, the drugs that I'm watching go through, start to go through clinical trial for the cancer center. So it is truly an amazing amount of money. Now, do the pharmaceutical companies need to make it all up in one year with their costs? No, but um, uh, it, it does take a preponderance of money to do this. There is one other thing that I wanted to show you on another program, and that has to deal with looking at the active site and finding out, um, trying to fit the drug in the pocket. And actually, this is a little demonstration that I found. This is Pymol. You can get it on your own computer. This is HIV protease that has a drug complex in the interior of it. So you want to look at the actual volume that each atom takes up in the active site when you're, when you're deciding on, the, on which drugs to, um, to develop. So you can see there's not much room in there that it can actually fill. What you're trying to do is look at the, look at the structures to see if you can find, so this is one drug, to see if you can find a pocket that it didn't satisfy. Maybe there was an interior pocket in here that it didn't look for. Or over here that you could develop a new drug and make it longer to come out and bind down here to this residue. So you're always looking at, <coughs> you have to look at the general shape as well. Not just the residues that are in there, but the general shape of the pocket and develop your drugs and, and design your drugs to fit the shape of the pocket so that you can get a real nice tight binding with the protein. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Physics and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible by Pfizer Incorporated. <laughs>